I got you a custom Diet Coke. So this is your favorite drink. <laughs> are we zooming I, in? On, are we getting that? <laughs> That's that is and wow, so, the manufacturing on this must have been so expensive. Feel, feel the, free to drink that because I also brought my favorite. The drink as high well. production value of this, what this little koozie, yeah. it almost looks custom made. Some might say it looks like gaffing tape wrapped around a can, but I would disagree. <sighs> I'm Savannah and I'm an atheist, kind of. Hi, I'm Josh and I'm a Christian, kind of. And this is the Holy Hell Podcast, where we look at the Christian religion from a spiritual and historical perspective to understand how the hell we got to the Christianity we have today. And we'll probably have a lot of fun along the way. I study Christian history, specifically American Christian history and its influence on American culture. And I pastor a church. I'm a pastor and I'm kind of doubling down on the whole Christian religion. Buckle up. It's going to be gonna super be fun. Ride. Let's What's, do it. Here we go. Do we want to talk about or lift off with what we're talking about today? Before we start. Okay. This is EP1, our first right episode gate. ever. We did it. We're here. And so I got you a nice welcoming, what are those called? Not a housewarming, housewarming gift. Housewarming gift. A pod, a pod, a pod warming, launch gift. A pod warming yeah, gift. Yeah, as they say, they, as everyone calls them, a pod launch gift. So... I know you're a Diet Coke fan. Yes, I am. And we have That's to like, we have to do the pixelation thing over Diet Coke because we're not endorsed by them. But <laughs> yet I got you a custom Diet Coke. So this <laughs> is your favorite drink. <laughs> are we zooming I, in? On, are we getting that? <laughs> That's that is. And wow, so, the manufacturing on this must have been so expensive. Feel, feel the, free to drink that because I also brought my favorite the high well. production value of this, what this little koozie, yeah. it almost looks custom made. Some might say it looks like gaffing tape wrapped around a can, but I would disagree. <sighs> <laughs> Has that, was that just sitting there? I literally just chugged this thing as you're doing your whole little riff on <laughs> We, okay, well, well, now I gotta crack mine open. Oh, my, where did that come from? Uh, I honestly it was in my house for like the last two years. I and don't. They, so the production company, that's interesting. So the product company that made my unique koozie said, "Why don't we also do handles of whiskey as well?" Honestly, I can't they even figured, follow what you're saying right now. I don't even drink, and I just now. did like two shots of whiskey. Cheers! Holy hell! Look at that. I can't do it. I can't even do another shot mm. right now. Oh God, it tastes better knowing. Anyway, subscribe to Holy Hell. Um, if you're our first, no, our hundredth follow. If you're our one hundredth follow, like, let me know because you know that. You're gonna and send I'll, that to I'll me. <laughs> send this to them in the mail. Is that legal? Can you the, do that? I don't think so. And also, shipping that would be sixty dollars. It's worth it for our fans. All right. I'm just wondering, <laughs> what do we think it costs to ship that? And also, can you ship something that big? That's liquid? open alcohol. I don't know if you can ship. We'll find out. This is holy. Also, if it's a minor, like I really with don't God, want all things to go to prison either. So, um, should we should we go off with our topic today? What we're Let's talking about? Yes, but also tell them why we started with our topic today. Do you oh, remember why? I I don't. <laughs> I honestly, if I'm being real with you, I did it because it was just in my head, and I was like, this would be a great topic to discuss. Was there an origin no. story? Yes. You're kidding me. Was it because everyone was damning me to hell? No, I oh. mean, same, but Spoiler. yeah. No, remember the first time we ever went and got dinner? I literally sat down at that restaurant, <gasps> yes. and you look at me, my, I wasn't even in first the chair. First time we had met. You didn't even know my last name yet. Yeah. And you look, you look at me, and you go, so, what do you believe about hell? That's right. I'm and great like at parties. And like three hours later. That's so, you're exactly right. That is exactly, I totally forgot. It was at that uh, taco place. Sure, I don't remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, what are your thoughts on hell? So our topic today is hell. Ayo. Broad. 10,000 foot yeah, view. Yeah, just hell. a nice light topic to start this off. So, and for, this is our first episode. The flow of this goes, I love research. 
I like to look at the history of things. I study it for a living. So how this flow will go is I will bring some research that I have found or I know and I'll present it. And you're going to kind of bring the spiritual aspect, the the good people perspective. Yeah. Uh, from a from a spiritual perspective, and we'll talk about it. And I think one of the first things that I wanted to kind of bring up was what are your thoughts around hell and how have they changed Oof. throughout your life, if they have? Oh man. So I grew up in a very conservative Christian culture, right? And what you are handed in a very conservative Christian culture is this concept of the hero and the villain, right? The black and the white. Yeah. There's a heaven, there's a hell. And you do this whole salvation prayer, this whole salvation thing. And a lot of people will say it's so you can go to heaven when you die. But really the thing behind it all is so you don't go to hell. Right. So the whole idea of believing in a deity, believing in a God was based around the idea that you don't want to burn in a lake of fire. Moral emphasis on fear. Exactly. Okay. A lot of fear. Very, now, very you, feel driven. How do you view hell now? Has that changed oh, man. at all? Yeah. I don't really believe in it. Mainly because yeah. it doesn't exist. Plot twist. End of podcast. <laughs> yes. I'm with yeah. you. Which is kind of interesting because I think a lot of the conversations we have on this podcast, I think theologically we are linear, but what's really interesting about our Christian history, how I was brought up, how you were brought up is that you expanded your horizon on Christian understanding and you left it. Yeah. And I did as well. And I doubled down on, I would argue the origin, the roots of yes. it. Um, but I think when it comes to Western evangelical uh, theology, I think you and I would probably be pretty linear. And I have a yeah. feeling we're probably pl pretty linear on this subject as well. I think so, because I also don't believe in hell. I mean, as a, I say atheist kind of, meaning I am somewhat open to the idea of there possibly being a God, but if gun to my head, they said, is there one? I'd probably say no. And that doesn't scare me. That's not something that I, f I don't find comfort in there being a God, but would be open to the idea. And so that's why I always say atheist kind of, with yeah. like a drop of a, being agnostic. But I think hell, what is so fascinating to me is that hell is never mentioned in the Old Testament, ever, not once. But it's mentioned a hell of a lot of times in the New Testament. And I always find that really fascinating is that in the Old Testament, we get that word Sheol. You've, you've spoken a lot, you know, you're, you held pastoral capacity roles before. I'm sure you've heard that word, that idea, Sheol. It's this Hebrew word. And we've translated it as the grave. I think I wrote down a couple of stats here. Yeah, in the Old Testament, the word shale in, in the Old Testament is translated as the grave 15 times, the pit five times, and hell 15 times. And then it's translated as shale 29 times. So it's the singular word. And then in English, we've translated it to mean different things depending on how we think it should be. And yeah. we've translated hell retroactively into a book into books where hell did not exist as a word or a concept. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that as someone who used to believe in it or has left, but you said you're going back to the origin in the beginning. What yeah. does that mean for you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think a few things. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is I think I would believe in a literal hell, but I don't believe in the hell that we have been handed, the hell that we have been given. Because mm, okay. there are times where like Jesus in the New Testament talks about a hell. Um, when I think of hell, I've seen people walk through what I think Jesus would argue is hell on earth. Yeah. We've seen genocide. We've seen millions die in a pandemic. We have seen economic destruction. Yes. Natural disasters. I would argue that is literally people walking through hell. I think there's sp specifically, particularly a couple of times in Matthew where Jesus is talking about hell, that is directly what he is, what he is talking about. But if you want to build an institution that gets people through the doors and gets them to sign the check, to yeah. check off the membership box, the most, oh, this is 
this podcast is going to get us in so much trouble. I'm just I already, say it, I I'm already sure. know where you're going with this, and I love it. The most generic and bland and easiest thing you can do is tell people you need this, and if you don't have this, this is where you're going, yeah. and that's a really bad place. So is it a yes or no? Yeah. There's no curiosity in that. There's no on wonder. There's no joy. I would even argue that theology is built out of cynicism even to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so if you want people to be part of something, fear is the easiest way to get them yeah. into a particular religious system, which is why I think it's so predominant in Western American European theology. It's a very yeah. easy way to pe get people through the doors and to stay there. Yeah, because if, and it, I think it always goes into often the topic of the prosperity gospel or, and sometimes I think nowadays we see a lot of evangelical Christians saying, oh, it's not the prosperity gospel, but it is, it's just revised. It's mm -hmm. a new COVID variation of the prosperity gospel. And it's this idea of, if you do this, you will avoid this bad place. And it mm -hmm. really is this dualistic, not to sound super nerdy, but like this dualistic cosmology of like... You literally said, not to sound nerdy, and you pushed up your glass. <laughs> not to sound nerdy or anything, but it's just dualistic dichotomy between heaven and hell. This idea, okay, just to... Because I know a lot of you watching probably have, I'm just assuming all 12 of you that are tuning in, have a heart for either understanding the history of Christianity or have a heart for being a participant in the Christian community. You're probably in one of those categories or parallel to one of those communities. And the idea that hell is this bad place and heaven is this good place and there's this dualistic cosmology, a bad place and a good place, is actually very, very new. And Going back to the Old Testament, we see words like Sheol and the way that the people in the Old Testament viewed the afterlife was really primitive and it was neutral. Everybody went to the same place. The word, that word Sheol is used to describe where bad people go and good people go. It's where in Genesis, Jacob says he wants to go to Sheol to mourn. He, it's a place that he wants to go to. And so you see this one word used as just this primitive effort to understand where we go when we die, because no one really knows the answer to that. And I think it's really interesting and kind of beautiful that the, the Hebrew tradition had this, this word to define this place that we go. And it's this place where your spirit and your character and your personality is thought to just rest and lie, good and bad. And then, Later on, English speakers retroactively went in and we decided when, when a bad person died, we translated shale to mm -hmm. hell. And right. when a good person died, we translated it to heaven. But it was the same word meant to mean the same thing. But we did this. And I find that really interesting and such, such a testament to the influence translation has on how someone later on reads the Old Testament. Someone who reads the Old Testament you know, or reads those scriptures in their early years is coming away with a different look on the afterlife. Someone today that reads the Old Testament says, holy hell, oh my gosh, there's this hell and there's this heaven and I need to avoid it. It's a concept that didn't exist in that book. So I always find that a little bit troubling <laughs> to mm. me to think, you know, you have this really neutral space in the Old Testament that everyone just kind of goes there. It's peaceful, it's primitive, it's really undefined and unrefined. And then you get into the New Testament and it's like the most defined dualistic idea of the afterlife we've ever seen. Right. And I don't, I don't know. I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on that? And have you ever wondered why the afterlife in the Old Testament looks different than the New Testament? Or has it ever even occurred to you? Was it something that spoke to you when reading the Bible? Yeah, I mean, I think you have different cultural, cultural imaginations between Old Testament and New Testament. You have new theological imaginations. You also have a brief span of history between the two. Before I answer that though, I mean, where are you on this idea of hell? Cause like you're asking me the questions. I'm actually mm, I know, really I'm going interested. Barbara Walters. This is you really to are. I don't want to get interviewed. I am yeah. just interested. The first question you asked me, which was like, yes, you don't believe in a literal hell. Then why, why the hell? Yeah. <laughs> 
why is it there? Why does it matter? Because I, mm. I actually like, and I think you're probably linear with me on this too. In Jewish consciousness, in regards of how things are written down, it's usually not the facts of the story that matters. Mm. I mean, just look at the four accounts of the resurrection. None of them add up. Yeah. Because to a Hebrew writer, it's why you're telling the story that matters. Yeah. And so I think the bigger question for me that I would love to ask you is why is it there then? Why does hell yeah. matter in the scriptures? And that's a good question because my answer, my answers, obviously what we said at the beginning are going to, my, the way that I answer is going to be very different than how you answer because right. I don't have anything spiritually at stake for me personally. I don't believe in hell because histo historically I can follow when the idea of hell emerged. Yeah. So between and for other reasons. For me, it doesn't make sense if there was a God to then, I can tell, my husband's in the room right now and we had a discussion on hell a long time ago on a long car ride. And I, I literally said, it doesn't make sense from a project management perspective for there to be a hell. Oh my for God. When someone, You're such an Enneagram too. I'm a three. I'm a oh very, uh, e efficiency is my thing. And it doesn't make sense. When you look at the laws of nature, everything, Plants grow in the direction of the sun, right? Water flows where gravity, everything is in an order. The idea that when someone dies, there's, there's something or someone calculating all of the acts of your life and then determining where you go, that's a huge administrative task. Administrative nightmare, right? Who's doing that? It's a waste of energy and space in my mind. It just didn't make sense when I was trying to, when I was a Christian, I was trying to hold this concept of hell and think, Okay, when someone dies, who's doing that calculations and what are their qualifications? Like who is qualified to say you're going to hell and then you're gonna burn forever? It just, and then creating a place, creating matter, a space to then hold all those people and then hold other people in heaven. I was like, this is a huge HR nightmare. Like it just didn't make sense. So that's when I really stopped believing in hell was when I was really trying to follow and look at nature, the laws of nature and science and saying, this doesn't make any sense. And that led me to go look at the history of where we got the concept of hell. Mm. And that brings me to this really funky journey, which puts us right in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament, we get this really unrefined word shale. It means afterlife, but it also means grave, but it also means like a place you go when you die, but it's also like a place to go rest. It's very unclear what the idea right. is. There was yeah. no clear branding strategy on the idea of shale. And then in the New Testament, you get hell, heaven, and it's very clear. Branding and PR really got their ish together, and it became this beautiful thing. So what the hell happened in the middle? Well, in the middle of the Old Testament and the New Testament are thousands of years. Right. And the, you have the, the people of Israel going into exile, and then you have the Babylonian takeover, where the mm -hmm. Babylonians capture the Israelites, and they take them to Babylon. And then you have some Israelites that escape and run off to Egypt. Mm -hmm. So now the Israelites' cosmology, their understanding of the afterlife, is being influenced. Some of them are being influenced by Babylon. And then the, those that escaped to Egypt are being influenced by the Egyptian cosmology. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about Egyptian cosmology, it is a crazy wild ride. It is insane. It's just all of these different people and characters and evolution. It's very cool. So you have the Israelites, some are going to Babylon, some are, go some are going to Egypt. Their cosmologies are getting influenced by them for hundreds of years. And then you have the, the Persian empire takes over Babylon and says, you know what, Israelites, we've had you for a while. We're gonna let you go back to Judea and rebuild your temple in 70 AD. And the Israelites are like, thank you so much. Really wanna go rebuild our temple. So they go rebuild their temple and then they return. Some of them stay, some of them go back. And now you've got the Israelites, their cosmology has now been influenced by Babylon, Egypt, and Persia. And then Alexander the Great takes over Persia. Again, so now Egypt is back in control. And so again, the Israelites' cosmology and theology is being influenced by Egypt, Babylonian, uh, Persian, some Mesopotamian cosmology. It becomes this kind of mixture. And Egypt becomes this huge epicenter for um, Hellenistic Greeks, which were just philosophers blending philosophy and religion in that time period. And so the Israelites' cosmology is being heavily influenced, again, by Babylonian, Persian, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Greek cosmology. And you look at Greek mythology, right? That's, we still reference that today. Mm -hmm. The Israelites, for, for hundreds of years, were just being influenced by all of these different ideas. 
And then we get the New Testament. After that's going on for hundreds of years of all of these other influences, then we get pen to paper for the New Testament. And we see the influence of this new idea of hell, Hades, the afterlife, we start to see that emerge. Jesus even says that in Matthew, he says the gates of Hades, not the gates of hell. He says the gates of Hades in the original language. It says, hey, do, which is Greek for Hades, but we translated it as hell. So we were like, we got a better idea. And we translated it as hell. So once I had that car ride, I was really talking it out, saying this doesn't make sense. This is an HR nightmare. Then it led me to go back and do all this research and say, what happened between Old Testament and New Testament? And the concept of hell in the New Testament is copying Egyptian, Babylonian, Persian, and Mesopotamian theology or uh, cosmology. It's just copying it. It's their iteration and their version of it. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean... Is that offensive to you? No, a couple things. Also, first off, you just nerded out so hard. I did. I know. I feel like you're going to do like a Zoom and I'm going to be like, but it, I feel like a lot of listeners like that. That's, oh, abso- they no, want absolutely. That I just want to recognize you're such a nerd. I'm such a nerd. You're I such am. A nerd. And it fascinates me greatly. But I always think of it as, for me, I'm a, I like the history and I like to understand, okay, but how did we get that word yeah, in no, there? Absolutely. But some people hear that and they think, no, hell is an idea that is unique to the Christian community and it's not. It's a complete right. replica and imitation of several different communities, cultures, countries, and empires mm-hmm. over centuries, if not thousands of years. Yeah. Does that for you feel offensive or scary or confused? Like how does that sit with you and your current understanding of, yeah. and where you sit with your faith? So I think a few things with that is I embrace what I call spiritual ambiguity, right? And we've, okay. we've talked about this yeah. where um, you could hand me something. You could tell me today um, Jesus actually did not come back from the dead. And I don't think that would rock my particular theological viewpoint. Okay, on something. that's interesting. Because I don't look at the Christian message or the message of Jesus as something that's going to give me life or breath after I'm dead. I see it leaving me breathless today. It does something that's inside of me. Yeah, it does something inside of me today that actually wants me to do good. Mm-hmm. It's and it wants me to be good, which then brings me to a much bigger point, which is if your faith, like if something as simple as creation not actually happening in seven days, if that rocks your faith, we've got to talk about why you believe, why you believe right. what you believe, what right? What mistake are you putting in that? Yeah. And so, yeah, so, so to, to your point, like, yes, I mean, the, the creation poem, heavily copy and pasted from the epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah. Um, there's like recorded 12 different pharaohs that resurrected from the dead. Right, right, right. And then you have Jesus' resurrection. But the cultural difference for me is why those stories were being told and also mm. how some of them were changed. Okay. You have Tiamat and you have Marduk in the Babylonian creation yep. story. And the whole idea is two gods that create chaos and disruption between one another. One kills the other out of one side of the carcass is the heavens of the earth. The other one is humans. And so the Babylonian creation story is all about chaos and disruption. It's all about you exist to make more babble, right? More noise, more chaos and disruption in this world. What the Hebrew storytellers of the creation story did though, was show you that creation is born out of love and joy belonging, equity, inclusion. So it wasn't them saying to exist is to cause more problems. To exist is to take over other lands and give them your, indoctrinate them into your belief system. It was the very first thing about life is that it is beautiful and it is good. And we are here to make more things that are beautiful and good. That brings me to the idea of Jesus and his resurrection being heavily influenced by Egyptian culture and Egyptian resurrection. The big thing that stands out to me though, is you have different, different Pharaohs, different Egyptian Kings and Queens that are, um, being resurrected throughout Egyptian culture. But you see the reasons why they were resurrected to become a King, to continue to be a King, to take over other land, not to spread love or peace or justice or equity. So is your 
view of Christianity, you view the purpose of it is to aid you in living a more loving and joyful life here on earth. That is what I'm hearing, and it's very mm. beautiful, is tell me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like your view, you say, I am a Christian, recognizing that not by, not in the normal or maybe in any sort of assumptive, assumptive way, um, presumptuous way. You identify as a Christian because the Christian text, the Bible, the messages of it provide you with tools and guides to live a more loving, functional, joyful, purposeful life on earth, not because it gets you into heaven. Yes. Um, yes, with some asterisks. I okay. think, well, first off, I think Jesus would be mortified that we made a religion out of what he said. So the idea yeah. of the institution of Jesus's message, which is kind of hilarious, yeah. kind of ironic for what part of my life's work is, yeah. which is being, if you want to call it a pastor. Yeah. Um, for me, the scriptures spark questions. They bring in awe and wonder and curiosity. It makes me ask more questions about why I'm here. I, I see the scriptures not as a linear, factual, historical document, which there are parts of that. Yep. I mean, you look at Leviticus, you look at Numbers, you look at, yeah, there are things about rituals and routines for humans, and there's a reason why genealogies matter in the scriptures. But the thing that, for me, it has always done is bring up more questions, and I feel like that's literally what Jesus would do, yep. is ask 188 more questions that he would give to give answers to things, right? And I think that's what the scriptures are supposed to do with us today. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I see the scriptures as a love story between humanity and in the divine, between God okay. and humans. And so I am going to reflect on that aspect of it as I move forward in my in my spirituality. Okay. Yeah. So Jesus is for you whether or not Jesus was the Messiah or resur was resurrected from the dead, for you, that's not why you are a Christian. It's the message. It's the call to love. Mm -hmm. And if you found out, like you said, that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you, your world would not be turned upside down because that's not what you're clinging to. Is that right? Yeah. And okay. it's because of what I feel like I have experienced in my life. There's been so many times I've tried to walk away from this whole thing. And every single time I do, I mean, there was a point in 2018, I was giving sermons, 2019, I was giving sermons. And in 2019, I had, I was like doing the whole travel thing, going sure. out, talking to other people, right? And I was getting a backdrop into, uh, you know, the mega church scene, the big church scene. And every single time I tried to leave it, there was this innate inward sense to me of doubling down on it. And I hated the idea and I'm an Enneagram four. So feelings come before logical thinking most yes. of the time, yep. um, which is such a great dichotomy between is, you and I. This yes. is amazing. My husband amazing. is an Enneagram four. So Ayo. we're very, we're very used to this dynamic. Mm -hmm. Very. I always say he has the passion. I have the plan. Exactly. That's yeah. kind of the motto. You are the facts and I bring the flavor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me sound like the most boring person on planet Earth. I and just, I probably am. I just have an ego that makes me think otherwise. But I digress. Whatever gets you out of bed. Yeah. I think, okay, so the, hmm, how should I frame this? I think the thing for me is when I see one of the very last things Jesus did was hand over an ideology of life to hand over a way to live your life to people. I see him handing over his words and say, now reimagine this thing, reinvent this thing. Like if our theology looks the same way today as it does, I would even argue a year from now, we haven't had enough imagination behind why we believe what we believe sure. or how to use that belief system in 2024 
And it should look different in 2024 next year than it will in 2025. Yeah. And I feel like that's what Jesus did. So for me, I see my purpose as a pastor. Um, part of my life's work is a local church in here in Portland. Right. And every time I tried to walk away, I couldn't. And now I've recognized the reason why is because I feel like part of my life's work is to re reimagine what church can be. I love that. And a big yeah. part of us reimagining church was helping people understand their spirituality or getting to where they want to be in their belief system. Honestly, which for me means I very rarely ever give answers to anything during a sermon. Very Jesus of you. Ayo. Oh, you very. want to hear one I did a couple weeks ago? It's so good. Like a question that someone oh, asked Oh, man. You? It got me in trouble with both sides. So this is what I did. <laughs> okay. I brought up the whole thing with like Peter walking on water. Sure. And I posed Classic. two ideas. I was like, for those of you who vehemently believe Peter actually got out of the boat and stepped onto the water yeah. and went out to Jesus. Are you at least open to the idea that Jewish exaggeration was massive in storytelling? Yeah. That you will look at war, like literally I would even argue before anyone else, Israelite war propaganda was massive, right? The exaggeration was unmatched. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. And so are you at least open to the idea that this is an exaggeration to get you to understand the why? of why this story exists. But for those of you, maybe someone like you, yep. who would say, there's no way Peter walked on water. Physically impossible, scientifically impossible. Are you at least open to the fact that maybe Jesus actually was who he said he was? And I literally just left it there. And the room was dead silent. I got, so unsatisfied. I got really, so yeah. many emails. Oh my God. But it raises a good question, which is you never, I might have my beliefs and ideas. No one will ever know for sure. So even I can't ever say that I know something definitive. We right. won't know. And I think you raise a good point, which is w whether you're coming from a more historical analysis like me or a spiritual journey and purpose, either way, there's neither one of us is ever 100% right. And I think it's, you bring up by doing that, you bring up a really good point and a reminder to those that attend your church is that you can never know everything for certain, especially with something as ambiguous as faith or religion and, and how we got here. It's so ambiguous. And I consider myself an atheist and I like to think that I know things definitively. I could be wrong and I have to be open to that. Mm. Otherwise, I'm doing what I claim other people are doing, which is pretending to know everything, that they know everything for certain. I mm. can't do that either. I'm just as guilty of falling into that pit and being like, I know this for fa the facts say, right? Maybe I'm wrong. And being open to that, I think you raise a really good point of acknowledging that and saying that there's, there's two sides and you have to be open and acknowledge that you don't know everything and you could be wrong, which is my least favorite thing to be is wrong. <laughs> Um, I want to talk a little bit about, I want to do a little pivot, but in a similar vein, we have a lot of imagery in pop culture and how we talk about hell. When we talk about the layers of hell or those that, uh, drank a lot will now suffer in hell by having to drink, right? We, we're, we have to suffer in the form of our sin in he like hell. And we have the ideas of fire and brimstone. And I want to talk a little bit about how we got those ideas because those are not in the Bible. Um, so you're, let me get this straight. We're going to talk about where the pointy horn. Yeah. Is that what, the horn, yes. Sorry. Oh my God. That gets me on another rabbit hole, which we won't get into today, which the diff, hell, that's the topic today. The devil, oh, that's a whole other can of worms. Hell, <laughs> and, or Satan, the devil, Lucifer, guess what? All three different. There are all three different things in the Bible. What? There, yes. And did you know? that Satan was just the, the, the word for villain in the Old Testament. It's not an actual, it's not a proper noun. It's, ju it's just, a, it's like bad guy. And we right. then are like, that's the devil. I'm like, no, it's not. It's literally not. But I digress and I'm not upset about no, it. No, no, this is huge for us though. Cause I think this is, ma this would be massive for those of our people who are listening or watching this on YouTube that believe in a linear theology that says there's a hero, there's a villain, there's a yes and a no, a black and a white, a heaven and a hell, yeah, it right? Yeah, exist, yeah. Because, like, again, when you think of, 
I would argue maybe what 90 to 99 percent of people in America, when you say what does the devil look like, we immediately go to the red idea, horns. Yep. Red, right? And then you have some massive Christian celebrities, whatever. When Sam Smith does a performance at the was it the Grammys? I don't know what it was. Was it uh, the Oscars? Yeah, I think it was the Grammys. MTV Awards. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Um, or maybe you're and right. he does he does this. Uh, whatever you want to call it, hell devil inspired performance. Yeah. And then you have all of these other pastors calling that demonic right. because it resembles a pop cultural yeah, that, definition of a devil. Lil right? Nas, his video, not in the Bible. So it can't be, it can't be heretical. It can't be blasphemous because it's literally not in the Bible. That's Honestly, creativity. Uh, we love to see it. So, okay. I want to talk about that for a second. Cause this is really, this is a question that I get a lot with people is they use this fire and brimstone imagery as a fear tactic to people that are not Christian. And what they're actually doing is using very recent pop culture and modern ideas of hell and proclaiming it as biblical. And it's not. And I want to explain this as clearly as possible because whether you're a Christian or not, it's important. And the whole point of this podcast is to understand how Christianity has influenced and changed into what it is today. So let's take it back to like the mid third century BC. So we're like, we're like 300 years away from Jesus even being born. And you've got this homeboy, Aristotle, and he's a philosopher and he's like the goat of philosophy. And he stays the goat for like a thousand years homeboy just like keeps putting out bop after bop after bop and everyone is just eating it up left no crumbs everyone loves aristotle wait did you say left no crumbs left no crumbs is that like a nashville thing no that's like a gen z thing it's okay oh. we'll talk about it offline you're old so, okay. so aristotle is just this superstar but then you get to around the year 1200 a.d so now we're 1200 years after Jesus has been born. So here's the timeline. Let's say Jesus is born here. Are we on, is the camera on me? Okay, I'm just, I'm looking at the camera to be like, here's when Jesus was born. 300 years back in history, BC, you get Aristotle and he's rocking and rolling, rocking and rolling, boom. And then around here is when Aquinas discovers Aristotle and says, oh my God, this is incredible stuff. I'm gonna mix it. Aristotle stuff with Plato's stuff and some of Jesus's stuff about a thousand years after Jesus was born, but 1200 years after Jesus has di died, this is where we are. So you got Aquinas here that's like, now Christianity's a thing and Christianity's been a thing for like a thousand years. Aquinas says, love it. I'm gonna mix Aristotle stuff. I'm gonna mix it with Plato and Christianity. And I'm gonna create this great idea of cosmology. And Aquinas whips up this idea of the afterlife and cosmology. And it looks like a center with rings and all these different layers of divine intervention, divine connection. So 300 BC, you have Aristotle, he's rocking and rolling. 300 years later, Jesus is alive and then dies and resurrected, depending on what you believe. And that's around year zero. And then 1200 years after that, you've got Aquinas who says, hey, that guy Aristotle was incredible. Let's mix him with Plato and let's mix him with Christianity. And boom, we've got this incredible idea of the afterlife. And it's these rings. Now, what does that sound like? What, when I say layers, what does that make you think of? Of anything in particular? Um, bean dip and yeah, heaven and hell. But more specifically, the reason that you say that it reminds you of heaven and hell is because the layers that Aquinas created of like, the center and then these layers. Dante then sees that and is like, that's incredible cosmology. I'm writing a sci-fi fantasy. Dante's, oh, and that's where we get Dante's no. Inferno. Exactly. So Dante's Inferno was this huge New York Times bestseller book because Dante said that slaps Aquinas. This is your best work yet. I love it says, love this idea of layers. So Dante looks at it and says, that's incredible. Now I'm going to write this sci-fi Christian fantasy about layers of hell and suffering. And everybody loves it. I mean, everyone just loses their minds over Dante's Inferno. And suddenly Christianity picks up on it and uses it to influence their idea of hell. And Christian communities and religious leaders at the time start like describing hell as these layers, not because it's in the Bible, but because Dante's New York Times bestseller told them. And it became this huge thing. 
And then later on in like 1660 something, I think 1667, we get John Milton's Paradise Lost, which is where we get the idea of revelation and all of that idea. And Don, uh, Paradise Lost really riffed off the idea of revelation, except John Milton looks at the book of Revelation as historical events instead of future events. So he's a little bit incorrect there intentionally. But that book also influenced our idea of hell and the afterlife and how we interpret the book of Revelation because of a book written in 1667. And so I made a list here. Wait. What? Sorry. Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, um, back to your Gen Z reference. Yes. Ate no crumbs. Left no crumbs. I'm 34. I was born. Is the camera on me right now? I was born in 1988 and I am still relevant. I'm only 34, sure. which I would think about getting a nose ring. Just give me a yes or no. I'm going to say no, because I like to be the center of attention. And if I have a nose ring, you can't. Well, then just grow a beard and we can be the same. We're already so 20. We're, we're already 20 with the shoes. I come back and I have a beard. You're like, one, how? I, <laughs> Two, we're good on the nose ring now. Like, or we just don't address it. Okay. Also, okay. you didn't hear my bean dip joke. In the oh, I did. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I heard it. But yes, also, yes. But yes. Was that the end of I your just, thoughts? Okay. No, it wasn't. It just... <laughs> I just okay. feel so... Old. It's okay. shocking, right? The Dante's Inferno thing. Was that what you were going back to? But it's... in. What's so interesting is how easy when something becomes famous... Yes. We indoctrinate it... Yep, that's true. ...into our belief systems... Yes. Yeah. That that was really it. I wanted to just clear the air with. You wanted to make sure me. that I heard the bean dip joke. Uh, mainly, I just wanted people to know I wasn't really old. <laughs> just so we're clear, you are old. <laughs> I am a young twenty nine. I'm in my twenties. You're a young for 29. another sixty days. So, I uh, yeah, uh, we'll leave it at that. And I'll be sure. I feel like I have like the. The Instagram to TikTok pipeline is so strong. And like, that's where I get a lot of my Gen Z lingo is TikTok. And so I just, I, and then also my sister is Gen Z. I'm so on she, TikTok it's just now. An, it's just an IV drip. Nice. I've, I've got the TikTok. I've got the sister just I mean, feeding me. Do what you want. So I'm yeah, on, hang out I'm on, on TikTok. I am now. That's where you'll learn the lingo. I literally have a fan. You have one follower? No, no, no. Oh. I, I have lots of followers. <laughs> I have to like 12, but I have one guy that's okay. like, you should have millions of likes. Cause I do the reels like I do in the studio. Oh, right, 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 right. And yeah, sorry. I'm just really trying to validate my age right now. Yeah, I'm everyone turning follow 35. Josh on TikTok cause I think that's no, what he's that's, subconsciously trying to say. I literally don't even have notifications turned on, but okay. He wants you to follow him. And then maybe like drop like your favorite Gen Z lingo in his TikTok with no context. And just not explain it. Uh, that's um, kind of sus. Okay. I have a list really quickly. This is yeah. very short. There are just four or five different things. Both Dante and John Milton. So Dante's Inferno and Milton's Paradise Lost, based on the 12th century, were all, they gave us the imagery of souls being tortured, fire imagery, demons, the idea that heaven or that hell is ruled by the devil, eternity, and that it lasts forever. They're the ones that capitalized on those ideas and really gave us those images around hell, not the Bible. Now, that's not to say that the Bible doesn't allude to the idea of torture or that it doesn't allude to the idea of fire, right? We can talk about the idea of Gehenna really quickly. A lot Go of, for it. A lot of people think that Gehenna was a dump site, and it was. Not necessarily, that wasn't its original purpose. Mm -hmm. Gehenna was the place people would burn children for sacrifices. And that's where we get the connotation of the afterlife and hell. And then Gehenna became a dump site to discourage people from doing child sacrifices. Child sac yeah. Exactly. <laughs> sounds like a bad thing to do. Sounds like a bad thing to do. So they turned it into a dump site to really turn people off to that idea but the idea of fire and the afterlife, when Jesus references it, and when people reference it in the, in the New Testament, 
they're referencing fire as a metaphor because that place that they're referencing was where they burned children. Right, right. So they're making a metaphor that people in that time would have totally understood. Yeah. We don't burn children anymore unless they deserve it. And so when we... We're trying to not get canceled. <laughs> we don't sacrifice children, right? So when we say that there's hell has fire, we take it literally. Right. We don't pick up on that metaphor. And so I find that really interesting. So that's not to say that the Bible doesn't link hell and fire right. for a different reason. But Dante and Milton really gave us that strong, fiery image, the idea that there is an evil entity ruling that space with like a pitchfork thing or whatever this thing is, right? That idea, the red, the fire, the heat, all of that is really emphasized in Inferno and Paradise Lost. And then we took it and ran with it. And now we see it like, I think even The Simpsons has an episode where like Bart is like tortured in hell by having like being force fed a bunch of uh, stuff I'm, because he was overeating. I, I'm a Christian. I don't watch The Simpsons. I'm sorry. Um, I'm so sorry. But there's this episode in The Simpsons, I think it's The Simpsons, or Bart, Bert, is that his name? He like go, Bart, Bert, 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 it's Bart, Bart, yeah. <laughs> my husband's like, it's Bart, I, don't, I actually Bart. don't watch The Simpsons, but I, I don't know who either. Bart I just, is. I've, I know it's a reference because I've seen it before, but Bart is tortured in the afterlife by being force fed food because his sin on earth was gluttony. That's Dante's Inferno. Yeah, absolutely. It's not the Bible. Yeah. And I'm, so we see it all the time. And anyways, I just find that interesting. And to me, if I was a Christian and I heard me saying these things, I would, I honestly would have a bit of a panic attack as a Christian if I'm really thinking that hell is a, is a place and time that is fire and torture. And now I'm being told that it's a fairly new idea. It's, a, it's really pop culture. That's what I would feel if I was a Christian. Now, luckily, I don't believe in hell, so it doesn't really matter. But people listening do, and they really convicted that there is a place in hell, and I want to right. honor that. Yeah. But you, as someone who identifies as a Christian, how are you holding all of this? Yeah, no, that's huge. I would, I would fall in the same category as you, but for the last 20 years of my life, my life's work predominantly has been working with those people okay. who sit in that, that particular bucket of yeah. there's a heaven and there's a hell. Beautiful important needed let's define what that actually is yeah and this goes to a much bigger conversation which i'm sure we'll get into down the road which is the literalness of the scriptures right like yeah. we should be reading it literally not literally don't get me started uh, okay yeah because you know jonah actually happened <laughs> it's a whole thing <laughs> it's a whole thing In, anyways but i think there needs to be and this is where mm, I'm going to get us canceled. This right. is where I think there needs to be a lack of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism. Did Fundamental, I say it right? Yeah, fundamentalism. 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 Fundamentalism on, on both sides. Yeah. Right? You have conservative fundamentalists, right? Evangelical fundamentalists. Yeah. And then there's those that leave the faith. And their life's work is built around making sure that everyone knows that if you believe this particular viewpoint, you are wrong and you are damning people to hell. Mm. And I understand that work. And I think that works good and important and needed, but empathy and grace with people's history and what they have been handed, yeah. particularly if they have built their entire human experience off of a belief, uh, off of a belief system sure. to rip that out of them with one fell swoop, right? Yeah. Is that the right saying? Fell swoop. I get, we're going to probably make merch out of this. I get all of my sayings wrong. All What's the, time. the one that I say, we were talking about with our friends the other day, fly by the seam of your, I say fly by the seam of your pants, not seat of your pants, which makes no sense. Couldn't tell you. I said the other day, as a cry flows. Instead of as the crow flies. Yeah. As a cry flows. Well, I've got some good ones. I've got some that I've actually taken. Kind of hits. That like became like rated R sayings that weren't even supposed to. I literally said the other day, I'll just, if we decide to take it out, out like this, this out. will be for our Patreon subscribers only. <laughs> it's just this one. I literally meant to say all out. Like, let's go all out. I said, let's go balls out. Balls. <laughs> Instead of balls to the walls or all out. That, oh, that's what it was. You mixed it. Balls to the wall. <laughs> Put it with all out. We're going balls out, everyone. <laughs> That's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. That's pretty funny. 
<laughs> and I can t- as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, balls to the walls and, uh, and I even all think- out. That's yeah. what your brain oh just God. mixed the two. Yeah. Okay. That's funny. <laughs> so anyways, empathy with people. Um, yeah. So I think that's massive is mm-hmm. something you just said. Honoring where people are starting their theological experience. Yeah. Right. I think the beautiful part in that work though is when you get the opportunity to see people realize that the thing that they were handed was so small and the world is so much more big, way bigger than that little box. Yeah. When you talk about people who go through a deconstruction journey, I think the beautiful thing that I realized was like, I don't think I was ever really in the whole conservative viewpoint, even as a kid. I was yeah. like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't, especially in the idea of God sending millions of people to hell out. As a kid, which I understand what the child's thinking is a little bit less than an adult imagination, but in my head, I couldn't correspond what I saw as grace and love of the message of Jesus to then that same version of that deity sending all these people to hell. Like there's already a contradiction here. And so when I realized that my particular theology, like as I started to dismantle that, I actually found like beauty and comfort to know my God actually isn't this small. And so I feel like if you just if we were as people who work with people to bring them out of a particular theology, to broaden their theological experience to broaden their spirituality. If you first start with the aspect of like, what if you were handed a very small framework of what Mm. Jesus is or what spirituality is and begin to open that up. I promise you, you're not going to burn in hell tomorrow. Let's go on that journey first and foremost, right? First, sign this waiver in case we're wrong. <laughs> Make sure but to tithe. <laughs> also, yeah, tithe just in case. No, I, I think that's a beautiful way to put it. And especially if I did not grow up in the church and I think my belief mm. system would be different if I had. I didn't yeah. grow up in the church. My family went every now and then for, you know, I call it CEOs, Christmas and Easter only, right? Like we would go and every now and then we'd go in between. I've never heard that before. CEOs, yeah, CEOs, Christmas, Christmas and Easter, Easter only. I mean, that's pro- and we probably went. We probably went five, six times a year to which our little Methodist church down the road, as sweet as can be, and it really was a, a wholesome experience. But it wasn't like we weren't a family that continually like when I was going through something. It wasn't pray about it, Jesus, you know, have a relationship with Jesus. It was you know, a, not a Christian household in that sense. I grew up in the South, so anything I got that was. Christian was by proxy, just by right. hearing it from teachers or friends, et cetera. But we didn't really grow up in that space. And so my brain did not get that early influence and impact of Christianity that I think is once you grow, once you have a kid that grows up in the faith, mm-hmm. it becomes a part of you in a way that is very hard to part from. And yeah. that I completely understand. Yeah. If you grow up in the faith, uh, you know, Christian faith, whatever. If you grew up in any religion, if you if you started from a young age and were told a way to view the world, a way to view trials, a way to view hope, what you hope in, who do you pray to, what do you place your trust in, mm. from birth up until you're an adult, letting go of that is almost impossible. I mean, right. that's your whole life. You're uprooting Everything. and having to re-examine and retroactively look back at decades of your life and say, was it all a lie? Was it true? How do I look at it now? What does this mean? I get it. To me, I always want to remember that I did not grow up in the church. So walking away from it for me was stepping out of a very shallow pool. Mm. Someone who's swimming in the deep end, it's a lot harder to get out. Yeah. And that to, and not, not that it's something to get out of. Yeah. For some people, faith and, and their faith in their God is what gets them through really hard times. I mean, who's to say when you look at parents that lose, you know, parents that have lost their children and people that lose loved ones to cancer or that Olympic gymnasts that lose their legs in a car accident, right? Re- relying on your faith in your God to get you through that. And that knowing that there is an afterlife where you'll get to see your babies or you'll get to see your loved ones. I mean, that's what's getting those people through every day. And there's a beauty in that and a beauty in humanity that we can overcome the hardest things in life if we have some, if we have hope in something beyond this life. And I think that's 
incredibly beautiful about something that's incredibly beautiful about the human race is that no other species is going out and questioning the afterlife like humanity is and when you're going through something so gut-wrenching and painful to have faith in a god or an afterlife or a belief system that says it gets better after this there's yeah. hope after this and that's what keeps you going yeah. To me, that's what makes religion worth it and beautiful and is sure. such a testament to humanity's relationship with whatever yeah. is after this, you know? Yeah. Yes. And what's interesting, I think, with your particular experience with that is I would argue the idea of looking at the message of Jesus as somewhere you go when you die is a very generic and bland way yeah. of looking at his message. Yes. Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, this um, theologian, he says that the whole message of Jesus is about, not about evacuation, it's about participation. Oh, I really like that. It has to do with life before death, living your actual life, which means your full identity, every single part of you, even the parts that maybe some particular spiritual circles have told you that part of your identity shouldn't belong, yeah. whether it's your sexual identity or, I mean, we go down the list, right? And <clears throat> I think if you see it, I think I said something earlier about it of like, if I were to live in the, the way of Jesus as something that gives me life, I think I'm missing exactly the reason why Jesus said most of what he said which was how to be here on earth now and what it means to be fully human, which means doing good and making good things in the world. Yeah. Which is why like I have such a, it's almost like when you get in those debates with people or conversations where um, they're like, well, if there's no heaven or, or hell, then why should I believe in this thing? That tells me you're missing the core reason yes, of why. the major point. Christianity exists for you to do good in this world. Yeah. And so if you're using that just to get out of hell for free card, you're missing the entire point. points. There is no faith in that. Faith is walking through life without knowing what the next step is going to look yes. like, right? Yes. And when you do good in the world, you come across a lot of bad in the world. That means going into, into the wilderness and to go into the unknown to do those good things. Yeah. That for me, that is, that is faith. For me, faith is not give me this very linear, somewhat surface level generic theology to let me know I'm going to be okay. Like that yeah. is a very selfish theology. And if the life of Jesus shows us anything, it's a lack of being selfish. Yeah, which totally aligns with what you were saying earlier in, in the podcast is that for you, your faith isn't just about getting to the good place for you yeah. it is you believe in christianity and you participate in it because you view the bible as a call to action for now to change your life and others lives here and now to participate in the environment yeah. and i think that's also just to gas you up and what you do and all you and emily and, and all of you guys is that you know with what you're doing with your church and your spiritual gathering and your idea of decentralizing it into the community, what you're doing is you had the opportunity to turn the light on you and make this the Josh sure. show. And instead you turned it outward. You guys are creating, you know, coffee shops and bit and putting your finances back into the business, which our coffee shop is called heretic coffee heretic company, coffee. little plug. And it's the best name ever. And my husband did the logo. So. Dude. Okay. Plug. Do you want to plug the logo? Cause it's like the most, yeah, badass it's logo. It's pretty ever. good. I don't know if we have a copy of it or a copy of it. A put put the camera on on me real quick. There's a logo. Watch you forget to put it <laughs> in, <laughs> and then it's just you going like this. It's just right here. Um, but I do. I think that's something that you guys do really well is decentralizing because that's exactly when you look at the story of Jesus. I mean, someone like me. Who, sure, I'm an atheist, but I can recognize that Jesus is someone I still admire as a sure. historical figure. I yeah. read that story and I think, what an incredible human being. And Man. the message. And we, what y'all are doing is that. You're decentralizing. Mm. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to get up here and everyone needs to come to the Colosseum and hear me and charge $350 for a conference. Instead, 
He said, go out, spread. I don't want to see you guys again. Like, go. I'm, in fact, I'm leaving. <laughs> like, right. You guys got this from here. And it called to action for everyone else to go out and disperse. And that's exactly what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. So for anyone listening who's like, oh my gosh, we're just meandering and we're like jerks. I'm a jerk. But what Josh is doing is actually very incredible. And I encourage everyone to check out Heretic Coffee. But I think you're living up to what you believe. You're not just walking. Sure, yeah. You're not just talking the talk. You're walking the walk. And y'all are actually doing it. Well, I, I think you said something huge in that. Like, no one dislikes Jesus. Right. No one hates Jesus. Yeah. It's the humanistic institution that was built around his sayings yep. that people have a major problem with, yes. as they should. But going back to, like, I, I see words for me. Words are huge. And so words like true, good, beautiful. Those are some of the first words spoken about humanity and the world. Mm, and so yeah. how you were saying of like going somewhere when you die and that's, that's the good place. The first thing that came to my mind was like, I think the biggest theological shift that I saw, which I would argue, uh, what's, uh, what's, I'm terrible. I didn't watch cartoons growing up. So I forget cartoons, but like the, what's the Christmas cartoon where the, like the, the heart got the Grinch nine times bigger, whatever. Sorry. Listen. Are you well? I watched Mortal Kombat when I was like six. You, you didn't watch The Grinch? I... If you'd like to fax me, press the star key. Yeah. I, anyways. Anyways. I <laughs> can't cancel that again. With, <laughs> an award. You never mentioned uh, all, all of our merch are going to come from our rabbit trails. About and the child mentioned a check. <laughs> oh my god i'm done i'm swear anyways go off with your point you didn't watch the grinch but heart grew 10 times yeah so when you're talking about going to the good place right yeah the thing that switched for me the most in my theology was that going somewhere when i die that's not the good place here and now this world yeah. you the people i get to do life with the coffee yeah. i get to drink uh, skin, like real skin, sex, surfing, f good food, yeah. walks throughout Portland. That's, that's it. Good. That is all of it. And that is good and beautiful and true, right? Not a place to escape from. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And the biggest thing that happened was, yeah, the heart grew nine times bigger. Mm. I began to see everything more, yeah. feel it more. Like I started caring about people. Yeah. And so I think that's when I chose to double down on the idea of being a follower of Jesus. Because for some people, their journey here and their experience here is not good. And how yeah. do, and you being able to say, this is a good place. I'm going to make it good for you, for people that need it. Yeah. That's I, really incredible. That's a great way to look at it. I think yeah. that's a great kind of culmination of, of what we've talked about is like the idea of hell and the afterlife has evolved. We've gotten influences from a million different places. It's not unique to the Christian faith. And what your response as a Christian to that is, yeah, that's not the main focus. And yeah. if that's what your hyperfixation is on as a Christian, you're missing the goodness of what it means to be a Christian yeah. and the actual purpose. If I'm just a Christian to get to heaven, it's not going to show up in my day-to-day -day life. If I'm a Christian because Jesus called me to make this place good for everyone, that's going to influence my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what you're saying, which brings us to kind of this nice culmination. I do have a final question for you that's out of pocket. It has, it has to do with religion, but it has nothing to do with hell. Can I throw it at you? Let's go. What would it take for you to join a cult? Who says I'm not a part of one right now? Oh my God. <laughs> but seriously, because my answer is so simple. But what would it take for you to join a cult? Like anything? Anything. Oh, man. A religious cult, let's say. I mean, all, wait, they're wait, wait. all religious. I have a better idea. Let's all, all tell our viewers what I think it would take for you to join a cult. Okay. And then you can do the one for Because I have my answer already. For you? Yeah. Do you have an answer already? Do you have an answer for me? No, but I know what it would take for me to join a cult. And I want to see if you're right or wrong. Limit, mm, endless supply of Diet Coke. N Tell no. me I'm wrong. No, but, but that's part of it. <laughs> well, let, let, wait, hold on. My, the, what it would take for me to join a cult is just all expenses paid. That's simple. If you pay for my house, my car, and my food, <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. And if you have a great 401k matching, in. 
I'm, I will join that cult so fast. I don't care what I have. I don't care if I have to wear a bonnet every day. I'll do it. I don't care if. So I, capitalism is what you're saying. <laughs> I wish that was our form of capitalism, <laughs> the all expenses paid. Unfortunately, we don't live in Finland, um, but that's another topic for another day. But that's what it would take for me is all expenses paid. Whoa. Truly, if they were like, we'll cover your housing cost, your bills, and all you have to pay for is any like, my husband's in the back like, yeah, baby, let's go. <laughs> like, you sign like, me up. <laughs> like, and I could still have my day job, sure. But even if they were like, you know what? Quit your job, we'll pay for everything. And if, mm. if there's something you want, We'll give you some work around the around the farm, and you can save up and get that top at Zara. No problem. I'm I am joining that cult faster than I can say yes. I mean, I will give you a blood sample. I will give you the date of my last haircut, my teeth. I'll give you whatever you want, and I will join so quickly. I just see toothless Savannah walking around <laughs> like I'm rich. It's incredible. <laughs> I have to pay for nothing. Like, and if I need surgery, no health insurance, done. Yeah, four hundred one k matching, done. If they're if they're public, they and they offer stop stock options, incredible bonus. But like, I think you just need to move out of the country because that's accessible in a lot of places. What it's sounding like is I just feel like I need to be taken care of, and like, America's not doing it for me. Um, everyone in Finland is like, lock, lock, no, no, block off, block off. She's on the flight, flight risk, can't get here. Um, okay, for you, what would it take? Hmm. Because I was going to say, no. What would it take for you to join? Like, oh, you get some sense, you, all creative agency, full creative agency. If they were like, you could, whatever you want to do creatively, we'll provide. Like, tech mm. stuff, mic stuff, platform stuff, like, we'll provide everything that you need. You can create whatever you want. Would you join then? Mm. Okay, well, for studio, for, everything. For our viewers that are watching, who probably know a lot about you. Maybe not. I'm probably the, the new face for a lot of people watching. Um, I'm a pastor kind of on the side. That's part of what I do. Yeah. But I do a lot of art. I do a lot of uh, film. A lot of things like, like this, right? Yeah. But I kind of have that now in my life. I can kind of do whatever I want, which is great. But... What if they offered you a leadership role in the cult? You know... Mm, okay, I'll be honest. You got to preach? I've done the whole leader thing my entire life i'm ready just to be in my studio and just make really good things and when they're ready just hand them out the window okay like, but that's go, not world. answering my question josh what would it take for you to join a cult give me an answer john mayer here instead of you <laughs> okay honestly i don't disagree <laughs> and in fact maybe my answer is i will join the cult if i get to be in the room for the podcast where john mayer replaces <laughs> Either either John Mayer, I'll take Maddie Healy from the 1975. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. You didn't know who that was. I only know who Maddie Healy is because of don't my sister. Don't say si it. No, because of my sister. Okay, I thought you were going to say the TS word. No, no, no. not talk about here. TS? The TS word. What's the TS? TS word. Do you not say that? No. Why? Because I have problems with her. You have problems with... I want our people... Hey, do you have problems? I just think she's not really in it for the music, but the money. Okay, but is that bad? Yes, because that is an actual desecration of art. What is are you it? talking she, about? But she, okay, I'm not a I'm not a Swifty, but I appreciate a businesswoman, and she had all of her sure. art. Sure, art is it's business. Like you've got to. We live in a world where you need money to survive, and if you can, make I know what it would more take. More money, more money. I know what it would take now. What? For her not to make music ever again and oh to honor God. art. We're gonna. Know that on I, that I stand note, with the Swifties. So no, please don't. If you're a Swiftie and you're like, oh my gosh, this is blasphemous. Know that I hear you and I'm with you. So stay for me. Stay in, stay in this podcast for me. I love Swifties. I think they are the cutest. I know. Most powerful group of people that could honestly change legislation so, when they rally. So literally, it's a cult. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Now hang on. <laughs> if y'all get together... And you guys say, hey, we are, gonna, we are going to, the level of HR required to run hell, let's channel that into organizing the Swifties instead. 
And then the Swifties put together an incredible cult. If you don't have one already, like if you're open to applications, if there's a link or something where I can apply and you can accept me, if you guys could rally and create a system where members of your cult paid a small fee, but then there was like an insurance policy and all of our expenses could be paid. Basically what I just said, and you offered all of those great benefits, I'm in. Swifties, what are you doing? You have, you have the power, the numbers, the finances, I know what y'all laid down for those tickets, so I know you guys are sitting on some fat piles of cash and free time. So let's rally together and maybe make some magic happen. How would that sound? Would you ever join that? Okay, yeah, probably. Yeah, I'm, it would sound pretty good. Plus, we would get all the sick Eras Tour merch. I want that little cardigan. I couldn't name, I could name maybe three Taylor Swift songs, but I would join a Taylor Swift Name cult. them, name them right now. Um, uh, okay, so from the 1989 one, you have... Um, you need to calm down. Is that it? No. Shake it off. Um, that's one. Yeah. 15 teardrops on my guitar. Nice. I went way back because that's the kind of Swifty I am. I'm like, y'all remember the one that, w are you a Swifty, Emily? Uh, uh, okay. Post, post, what is that? Like one album? God, oh. she churns out albums like John and Kate. Because she doesn't care babies. about My the God. art. She cares about the business of it. But if they all are a success, who? but is there something wrong with, with that, with, taking, with, with pursuing the business? I would argue, as a four would say, it's an exploitation of the beauty of art. Is it? If, her, if the art that she churns out that's very successful is still beautiful. I said what I said. Oh, my God. I, but is it, though? I will say folklore it, and... Um, Evergreen, Stardust. What's the other one? Evermore. <laughs> I will folklore and Evermore. They're the same album. Wow, that's that's creativity at its best, They're right the there. They're the same. They're the same album, and I think she would say that too. I think she should have maybe picked. Or we needed to trim the fat on that and just make that one album. But for branding and PR, I see what she was doing. On that note, I think this is our first EP. Done, baby. Done. All that to say, I love Taylor Swift. Um, I'm sure she's great. And, you know, she's an avid watcher. So, you know, Taylor, if you're watching, like, let's get you in here. Are you going? You're not going to John Mayer, are you? No, dude, I tried to get tickets. We were literally on say. a FaceTime together. We were on the FaceTime together. And FaceTime. did you get tickets? Yeah. Yeah, because mine kept going. timing out. You need to go back because they've got some now. Go back and yeah. look and see. So here's my thing about John Mayer was I was, I'm a big luck electric guitar guy so yes. like i want to see the big band and the next time i see john mayer i want to like do the front row seat like i will take out a second mortgage because apparently i own a house but like in portland <laughs> in this, and i work if i literally have three nonprofits. you could own several houses if you joined a cult i'm just saying That's but anyways true. so yeah because oh because i've i've seen john mayer big band style so i want i would love to see because this is just him and his guitar i think right it's just, yeah it's just which i'm so excited about i think it's next weekend it's the 11th yeah yikes you should see if you can get to they're probably not I as would. expensive anymore you know i did hear that the acoustic tour wasn't isn't that good really yeah yeah mm, i don't know i love acoustic john mayer and we're floor seats so i'm very i'm also a concert bougie person if right. i'm not on the floor i'm not going <laughs> yeah in the background going oh speaking of big bougie Concerts. Yeah. We went and saw the 1975. You love the 1975. You know, that's kind of a new thing for me. You love the 90s. That is all you post about on your stories. It's becoming a 1975 fan okay. account, and I'm wondering if maybe they know and we could maybe get them to sure, like, that's give you a fine. shout out. Okay, a couple reasons why. Um, their music's great. They, they are great musicians. Maddie Healy. Is part of that band. <laughs> I don't know what he looks like. Is he cute? Okay, put, put, the, camera, put the camera on me. Me, Maddie Healy. Me, Maddie Healy. Is, See what I'm are saying? Are we inserting Maddie yes, Healy's image uh, over you? Is that what yeah, she's doing? Do y'all look alike? No, not at all. Oh. I'm just saying like there's me and then there's, oh my God, there's <laughs> Maddie Healy. Anyways, we went and saw their, um, what's the, <laughs> what just happened? I go, do you look like Maddie Healy? And Emily just goes, ha <laughs> ha And just like started laughing so hard. Okay. Is this podcast really going to turn into literally you bullying me the entire time? You, you were bad mouthing Taylor Swift. And I just wanted to say as someone who's not a Swifty, but has respect for a hardcore businesswoman, 
what she did to gain the rights to her art while also trying to make room for new art. I thought she was doing that very well. I agree. I just wish she wrote good songs. I'm with you. I don't, Leo. Oh. Um, what's the one song that came out, and I swear we'll land this plane, but what's that one song that came out and she did it with the guy that was part of another band? Um, no, it was like an upbeat. I, oh, shit. I don't even remember what it was called. Um, she did it with the guy from Panic at the Disco. Something like that. Um, y'all are listening. That was not a good song. And I've actually talked to Swifties about it. And they have said that I, many of my friends have said like, yeah, not, not the greatest. So mm. she has some flops. All that to say, I respect them. Please don't stop listening because Josh doesn't like Taylor Swift. Please stay. But if you Please. want me to join a cult and Taylor Swift, and I will join that cult. All right. We've settled then. this. Swifties, time to rally. On that note, like and subscribe. Are we going to monetize our YouTube account? No. Is that going to be a thing? I don't think okay, so. Okay. Well, if we, if we ever we do, can. just... Just like Moses split the Red Sea, we'll split that monetization. Right I love that we haven't even finished recording the first episode. And you're like, so when are we, are we splitting the first million or are we? <laughs> Duh. What oh, percentage but we I, set aside? I do want to plug what we're going to attempt to do for Christmas. Cause I'm going to talk about it every single week. Cool, 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 cool. For everyone who is here locally in Portland. Yeah. Or nearby. Or nearby. We are hoping for Christmas yeah. to do a live Christmas show. Yeah. With Taylor Swift. With Taylor Swift or John Mayer. I'll or bend my both morals. and things could get really bravo. <laughs> and they could oh finally we could finally hear like Taylor's side of it. Oh my god, we got to land so this fun. plane. This is getting so bad. Okay, anyways, thank you everybody f for for listening and I think that's everything that we that's have it. to Let say. Let us know what you want us to hit next cuz we don't do we have a topic for the next one? I got Not a few yet. I know we're going to hit, but okay. let us know. Let Follow us, know in the us comments. on Instagram at Holy Hell Pod. Is that the it? Holy Hell Pod. The Holy Hell Pod, because Holy Hell Pod was taken. Ayo. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. Peace.